Hello, and welcome to episode number three of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Today is Sunday, June 22nd, 2014. I'm Melissa Agnes, and this podcast is brought to you by Agnes Day. Let's talk crisis intelligence. Hey, Jim. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me here today. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Well, I'm Jim Spacuza, and I'm the CEO of Crisis Go. And what we do is we provide a mobile app to help communicate during a crisis and to provide all the things that organizations need to have with them during a crisis. Um, all those things that were typically found in three ring binders and flip charts that organizations use at the time of a crisis. Which I absolutely love because anybody who knows me knows that I'm all for bringing organizations' crisis communications to today's technology, today's tools, today's, you know, modern modernizing it. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's what really happened to us. We got drawn into this um, as a, a school district came to us and said that, hey, we need to take this information out of these three ring binders and put it on our phones and pads because, you know, we always have those things with us. And we said, boy, you know, coming off of Sandy Hook in that period of time, we understood their pain and we understood that the old way really wasn't working for them. Absolutely. And, you know, the old way, whether whether people realize it or not yet, um, some are, as we both know, but the old way is not, not going to work for anybody, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, especially when there's so many organizations today that, you know, sometimes people work from home, other organizations, they have people out in the field, they have people, you know, doing long distances of travel, and not everybody is in the same spot all the time. And not everybody, and not just that, but a crisis doesn't start, you know, doesn't take place from nine to five. Typically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, you know, with, the, with multiple shifts, um, people are always moving between uh, shifts during the time of day. So, you know, managing all of this has become very, very difficult. And the biggest organizations across the country um, still have, like, their crisis plan on their intranet. Now, how accessible is that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's so, um, yeah, it's very restricted. So, you know, the importance... And the power of mobile technology in crisis communications. Let's talk about that. Let's give people a sample of what that really means. Well, as you, as you start to look at crisis management, you're talking about two things. You're talking about access to information and the ability to communicate during a crisis. You know, it, it used to be the information was all paper-based. And the communication, maybe it was a walkie-talkie, a two-way radio, like you said, and those were only available for people that were actually at the organization within a radius. But, you know, our kids have started to use technology um, that lets them communicate from anywhere to anybody um, so quickly and effectively that many crisis uh, events are communicated out by uh, kids, students, uh community members before the crisis team even has that information. That's why I think it's so important that we see this transition from paper and old methods to the type of communication tools that are available today. Absolutely. And then we go into things, you know, so you're talking about radio, radio technology or, or um, uh, walkie talkies. You know, I have, I have a lot of clients, for example, in energy. So some of the best of them, they have this, well, some of the best of them, they have this um, radio, but um, in, their, in their trucks, they have a system where it's a touchscreen, right? Where you, you're supposed to check in, you're supposed to do report what you're doing, you're supposed to do all that. It's great in theory, people don't use it. If people <laughs> aren't using it, that means that in a crisis, if you're relying on that to, to get in touch with you know, members of your team in real time and people aren't using it, it means they're not looking at it. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think also that in organizations that I've seen, many of them still want to use email and text to message somebody 
or a, I hate to say it, but a phone call tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which is time consuming. So the great oh. thing about mobile is that Text is text isn't bad because they ha- it has that that those push notifications, which is what I wanted to talk about. So, the great thing about mobile is that no matter what, no matter who, if we look at, for example, the Calgary floods um, that happened up here in Alberta, Canada last year, they leveraged the power of mobile technology um, within to communicate with their citizens, and they didn't suffer. They didn't lose. They didn't know there was not one death in Calgary because of how well the city really leveraged social media, mobile technology. But what they grasped, what they understood was that people are leaving their homes and they don't know where to go or they don't know if they're in a safe zone. So what do they have on them? Absolutely 100% for sure. It's their telephone. So those push notifications. So, you know, Crisis Go, for example, you guys have an awesome app. So, well, thank you. <laughs> you're, well, thank you. I've been playing around with it, so thanks for that. <laughs> but um, so you have this awesome app that people that you know organizations can get their entire staff to download. You have different rules for different um, you know levels of, of members of the staff or whatever it may be. People who need to access dis- different parts of the crisis plan, and you're able to send those push notifications. So even when the lock screen is on. You can see, oh, hey, there's a, a communication there that I need to check out. Yeah, this this ability to message two way during a crisis is what's really been missing. Um, this, the ability to notify your community members, notify your staff, and then the ability to have them respond to you, is really the power of of the mobile technology that we're seeing today, um, and. As I say, push notification, you know, this push notification should have a different tone than Mm -hmm. a text, than a text message that comes to you from your wife or your spouse, because you want people to stop and to say, okay, this is important. And, and that's the key to action is drawing their attention away from what they're doing and putting them into focus on this crisis. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in your experience what should so for organizations out there and I I talk about this a lot in speaking engagements and with clients and I'm always looking for how can we you know I'm hired to go in and and say okay how can we make your Christ communications better mobile technology maybe not for everybody but especially for those large organizations is it's a very powerful tool so what would be some things that you feel in your experience that you've seen that absolutely for organizations that are thinking about, you know, having an app created or going with, you know, somebody like a company like crisis go that already has that app created. What do you absolutely recommend or, you know, want to suggest that needs to be included within the functions and, and, you know, features of an app for crisis okay. comms. Okay. We look at it. And first of all, the app itself should be inclusive. You should be able to get through the entire crisis using one app. We've heard from clients that trying to have one tool to use for messaging and another tool to find my evacuation maps and another tool to uh, reach my contacts and uh, understand what, uh, uh, what people are in my facility as you jump from tool to tool to tool, the crisis gets unmanageable. The data gets distributed across multi-platforms, and it's just really, really difficult to manage. So what needs to be in that app is access to that content that you really need. That content should be available based on the role within the organization. Then you need to have those tools that allow you to message based upon your chain of command, right? Absolutely. Because to just message everybody and to have everybody messaging can be more confusing than not messaging at all. And risky. Yeah, so risky. So getting a structured communication plan that's built for your organization based on the type of crisis that you're going to be facing, that's important. We also think that the ability to set off the alert or to notify everybody that you have a 
a significant crisis. Um, today we see that push down to many more uh, staff members within our organization because if you have somebody who enters your facility with a, a firearm, you want anybody who sees that to be able to notify the rest of your staff and to get them to a safe shelter. Absolutely. So you're talking, you know, having full access to every part, every important part of the crisis plan at your fingertips in one app and a way for everybody, no matter who you are, to alert everybody who's associated to the app. Yeah, particularly for those major types of crisis where, where seconds make a difference, right? Absolutely. And so we know that you don't use those things on a daily basis, but having an app that you can use frequently for other minor types of crisis within the organization um, is valuable on a day-to-day -day basis, and then people are comfortable with going there to set off an alert for a major event. Let me tell you, like, what do we think about, like, our minor crisis? Maybe it's sexual harassment. What are my steps? What if it's um, a situation where somebody in your organization has uh, passed on uh, the sexual predator type of information? You know, as you deal with these within your organization, these aren't things that you're going to set off an alarm or an alert, but these steps that you'll find in your checklist will help you to make sure that your staff executes your standard operating procedure correctly and effectively every time, which obviously is there to save you um, risk on uh, your reputation as well as uh, legal. Absolutely. And um, what, I, what I find really great and what you guys have done is the different roles. So everybody has access to everything that's important that they need, but then there's certain people within the organization who have access. So you're talking, for example, you're saying, you know, something, I'm not going to underplay it and say that it's minor, but it's not a big crisis that affects the whole organization or the public. So something like you want to report sexual, sexual harassment, having tools to, you know, I'm always talking about trust and um, building relationships externally, but it goes for internal as well. You want your staff to know that there's a safe way to communicate and that if they do report something, for example, say there's a function on the app that allows them to report something like that, so it, they don't want it to go off, uh, uh, you know, to everybody. At the same time, they also don't want to be penalized, right? So there's this, there's a, a factor there that people are scared to come forth. And that's right. just always been. So is what about functions where you could report something more minor than a very severe crisis um, anonymously? Or do you uh, think that that's a relevant function? You know, as we look at the community college and the university environment, we see lots of students that are concerned about situations but don't report because it's not anonymous. So systems should allow you to have the ability to report anonymously. In a school, you know, bullying almost always is a, an anonymous type of tip. But also, as you look at community, right? If I'm a, if I'm a citizen and I see something, um, but it might be controversial, do I have a safe way to report that back to the city manager um, and know that it's anonymous and protects my identity, but I can bring forth a concern within my community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I had a question and it's escaped my mind. <laughs> but uh, let me just think. We were talking about, oh, it, it was a little bit further back. <laughs> we're talking about roles, responsibilities, um, notifications. Oh, it'll come back to me. That's okay. So, Oh, it's so important. It's it, you know, and it's we have all of these tools at our disposal right now, where crisis plans and processes, procedures don't have to sit on a shelf or in a file. Whether the file is on the computer, or whether it's you know in a drawer somewhere, and these tools, you know, it's all about it's all about communicating effectively and efficiently in real time, internally and externally. And there's so many tools. The power of technology is just is bringing us there. It's enabling organizations to really empower themselves 
for worst case scenarios. Ah, I remember what I was going to say, which actually goes with this. Um, so we're talking about different levels of, um, you know, of staff or, and what we see today because of social media, because of technology, because of all of the way that society is going, the direction that society is going in, anybody can spot a looming crisis or uh, an upcoming crisis, you know, a crisis on the way. Anybody can from the CEO's wife to, or husband to um, the door, you know, the doorman downstairs or, you know, the secretary's mother-in-law who, who Facebooks them. So anybody can spot a crisis and it can come in any way. And a lot of organizations still have this mentality where, okay, only our crisis team is going to have access to the crisis plan and only our crisis team is going to be trained. But the reality is that every single person within the organization needs to have some form of training. And if you're leveraging a great tool, like a mobile app for internal crisis communications, they absolutely need to have access and they need to have um, training on it. I 100% I agree with you. With mobile applications, we're able to distribute the plan to many, many more people within the organization cost effectively. And by doing that, you, you don't know that it's not the janitor who is the guy who is best prepared when a gunshot goes off within the building. Absolutely. To, to mobilize people to get them to do the right things because he might be very comfortable in that environment of hearing gunshots where your, your crisis manager might not be. You know, that might not have been uh, something that he was or she was around on, enough to feel comfortable when that shot goes off. To identify, you mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And also there's human, human nature there. Some people freeze. Some people yeah. are quicker on their feet in very, very hostile, you know, stressful situations. That's just, that goes differently with every individual. We're all different. We're all made different. So that's an excellent point. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, it's one of the keys to being able to be successful. And it was one of the things that also came out of Sandy Hook. They felt that if more people would have been more prepared, and obviously because you never have your crisis team in the room when you have a crisis, if more people would have been more prepared, they think they would have done better. Now, I don't know that that means they would have saved more lives, but the question has come up over and over. Um, and most people believe that it means lives in many situations. Well, we could all be, we could, in retrospect, we could, especially in a, uh, such a tragic situation as Sandy Hook, I think that's, that's normal human behavior, right? To go back and say, what if, what if? Um, and it's also survivor's guilt and, you know, different components there. But the, the fact is that organizations do need to be prepared um, for different types of crises. And unfortunately, we live in a world where we see more of them for some reason, you know, especially, you know, school shootings, for example, or just shootings in general. I mean, last week there was one in California at drive-by and it's just... I don't know, we, we're seeing more of these tragic incidents. So they're becoming more um, that and, and just anything. I mean, if you're an oil company, well, you need to be prepared for different types, an oil spill to, you know, a reputational crisis that affects share cost, share price. So it's very, very important to be ready. And the only, re the only way that you can train your team to have that instinct, for example, you have, you have an app, you have some kind of tool um, on the phone for that everybody can access in a crisis, their instinct needs to be to grab that that app, to open that app, and to use the the tool effectively. So training, simulations, trainings, workshops are so important, and for every level of personnel within the organization. I I fully agree, and I think that as you look at um, drills to be able to um, simulate what you might run in a real situation, the use of mobile technology allows you to do it in a much more distributed fashion. You've often heard of the tabletop drills, right? Mm -hmm. 
I've never seen anybody validate their plan by sitting around a table. Nope. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Right. It doesn't work. You, but if you put somebody in the field and they have a mobile app and you have seven steps that you want them to do in the first two minutes, they can go through the mobile app and mark those steps and add any comments, concerns, or questions, or things they couldn't do. And you can validate your plan. So your plan might be excellent for two of your facilities, but it might not work for the third one because of either logistical or, or uh, facilities-based uh, 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 challenges that you're going to face. So, you know, realistically, all this work we put into our crisis plans is only worth it if we validate it in the field in which we're actually going to experience the crisis. And obviously, if you're at an oil well and you think you can validate it uh, sitting around the table in the office, you're probably um, going to come up short and, uh, and with some severe challenges at the time of the incident. Absolutely. It's so important. It's key. And, um, you know, I, I, it used to be, for, for my company at least, it used to be that we would see we would help organizations plan, create the crisis communications plan, help them whatever they need to do to make sure it's effective, and then we would test. So we'd, we'd launch them into a simulation. We'd do a simulation exercise where we choose whatever crisis and we launch the team into it. Now we're seeing more and more organizations that are coming and saying, we have a plan. We would like you to test it to see if we need, you know, to see how we could improve it. So we're seeing um, there's like this shift right now. Also, crisis communications is a hot topic right now for many different reasons, social media being one of them, issues management, crisis communications, it's a hot topic. So I think it's on the top of everybody's mind. But we're seeing this shift where people are coming in and saying, we have a plan already. We just, we want to make sure it's actually good. And every time we, we go through those exercises, there's always things to improve. And it goes with personalities as well. You know, you have new personnel, you have a new member of your crisis team. Well, maybe the dynamic has changed now and something, we could do something to make the plan more efficient, more effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. I often think that the best way to measure our plans is a, the AAA approach. First of all, is our plan accessible? Is it actionable? And is it accurate? And, and we look at each plan that we, that we get involved with, and we ask ourselves all those, all those pieces. Can the person actually get to their plan? How long does it take? How are they going to uh, be notified that, that, that they have an incident? And then are the steps, are the tools that I'm using actionable? In other words, am I reading a paragraph? Am I reading a step? Am I looking at a map that actually can direct me out of the facility? Um, am I looking at accurate data? Just like you said, change in personnel happens in many organizations every day. Are you able to keep up with the changes that you have within your organization, uh, either your staffing or your facilities, and keep your plan up to date? I know you can't do that on paper. No. It's, oh, it's, no. it's extremely... Uh, time-consuming to distribute a change in a plan on paper. Uh, and with mobile, obviously, it's a press of a button, publish, and the plan goes out to everybody. It's updated and it's new. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking of the word mobile, and I'm thinking when we started this conversation, you and I, we we said that intranets, people, a lot of organizations have their crisis plan on their intranets and that it doesn't work. And I'm thinking we didn't explain that and the explanation is in mobile mobile yes you have it um, on you all the time and, and you have instant access and all of that but with it the plan is on the internet and you need to move locations and you're not in front of you know your your computer or you don't have your ipad or your perhaps often the case your internet is not um uh, responsive so it doesn't downsize right properly right. with the phone mm -hmm. When you have an app dedicated to your crisis communications protocols, you have it everywhere you go. If you have to run into the next room and communicate with another member of your team, you still have that on you. <laughs> so, you know, that mobile, the mobile word, the word mobile is just, it has many different layers and many different benefits attached to it when it comes to crisis communications. 
Absolutely. And, and the other thing that, you know, we talked about these plans um, being accessible, they're with you, but they need to be with you whether you have access to the Internet or not, you have access to the phone lines or not. The plan needs to be on the device. So as you, da- as you download your plan, the plan has to reside on the hard drive of the device because Joplin uh, West in Texas, these devastations that happen there wipe out the communication infrastructure. And when is it more important to have your checklist steps of the things you need to do than when nobody else can help you or direct you? Absolutely. Excellent point. Excellent point. It's so, you know, and I, I keep saying I'm so passionate about it, but mobile, or not just mobile technology, but just technology today is so, it can be so beneficial if when we realize the power of it and what it means for us individually as organizations, what it can do to help us when we're going to need it most. What is... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love to ask this question. What is the, you know, the most common aha moment that you see organizations have when you're talking to them about mobile technology for, or mobile apps for crisis communications? What's that one thing that, or one or two things that you you see consistently? Well, almost all the time when people see the app on their device, on their device, whether it's a phone or a pad, the speed of access to the content is so fast. Um, one person asked me, they said, well, tell me, tell me what's the difference between if I have it on my intranet and I'm using a web browser on my phone or you have it on your app. And I said, I just want you to scroll through your intranet page and hit the 10th the item and drill down and start to access your content. On the mobile phone, if you think about how we even access lists like the states when we fill something out on our mobile phone, on a phone for like a form, you know, we can zip through all 50 states in second, less than seconds. And it's that speed and the organization. And when people see that and see how fast they get to the content that they need, they're like, this is a no brainer. Why didn't we think of this before? And and that is almost every time we put it in people's hands. Excellent. Excellent. And you know, I get that too. I get that that what you just said there, why didn't we think of this before? I see that all the time. And and people, because they really do care, they're so, especially I see it a lot with them. when I do my my simu- our simulations or trainings, workshops with um, organizations and their legal department is there. And the legal department for example, Mm -hmm. is responsible for everything to protect the organization and everything legal that needs to go into whatever the organization is, right? Every legal aspect. Their job, and so they'll ask me questions and I'll, I'll give them an answer off the top of my head, whatever it is, and they'll sit there and go, well, why didn't we think of that? And the answer is because you have so much on your plate. This is what I do day in and day out. You know, you're asking me a question on something that I, this is all I do, whereas you have this broad job description and you have so much to manage. It's normal that you didn't think of this. You know, you don't have the time that I have to think about this in particular, you know? So, and that's, I mean, that's just an example with legal, but it's funny that you say that. And so people shouldn't, they can't be hard on themselves for not having thought of it. Their role, their responsibility more often than not is not solely Christ communications as is ours. So right. you can't have all the, the answers if you don't have the experience and you don't have the time to sit there and think of every single nuance and every single risk and every single protocol. So anyway, it's just a little, little tidbit since that, that made me think of that. Right. Which is, which is why you need people that can bring best practices to your organization um, and help you um, maybe not tell you how to do your crisis plan, but can give you information to look for gaps. And that's what we're really doing. We're trying to identify those gaps in the organization's plan that could put them at more risk and, 
and cause them to have loss of life or loss of property or loss of reputation. And by filling those gaps and using the right tools to do that and adding speed and, and accuracy, we can often change a, a disaster um, outcome by, by having their staff more prepared. Absolutely. You know, I love to look at, I love to look at what, you know, a, an organizational crisis that affects reputation and it's, it's, it's a very big deal for the organization. And then when you go into emergency management, we're talking loss of life. We're talking loss of, you know, imp, you know, acts of God sometimes or act or war zones or, and so for example, if you look at, um, organizations like, Police departments, or um, the Amer- the um, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Mm-hmm. These a lot, many of these organizations, a lot of police departments. Actually, funnily enough, I'm I'm learning more and more of the amazing things that they're doing to leverage social media and mobile technology for their crisis communications, and how it's just working so well for them in a crisis and out. And then you look at the International Committee of the Red Cross that's responsible for, you know, they have um, members of their team in war zones where their lives are at stake or they're helping, you know, an, or, uh, a community that's been hit by, you know, a tornado or a tsunami or, you know, they, these are real emergency crises. All of them, the best of them, are leveraging mobile technology and social media to communicate effectively. So if we, if we say that the most severe crisis, crises where loss of life is at stake, or life is at stake, I should say. And these organizations responsible for this, if they're leveraging these tools and these platforms, then organizations whose crises are very, very important for them, um, you know, can deeply impact the organization over the long term. We're talking reputation and bottom line and share price. It can work the same way. You know, we, if, if those other organizations are, are leveraging them. There's got to be benefits there, and there's ways to make it work for them. I agree. I think that the the thing that we're going to have to sort through as we go forward is there's a variety of different types of communication here that are available um, that we see and that we address today um, as we look at uh, how we manage crisis, Right. The, the communications break down into personal communication. In other words, I'm in, in a personal situation where I need assistance. And you, you've probably seen tools like this that allow you to set off an alarm that notifies police that I'm in a situation of crisis myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one's a very important tool. The next one is the ability to communicate to people based upon where they're at right now. Event type of communication, the ability to communicate to people along a floodplain, the ability ability to communicate to people who are um, located within a group of facilities, but not everybody. So by mixing in the GPS management tools along with crisis communication tools, we're able to now message down to an individual or a regional group, or our staff within our facilities. And that just is exploding across the country from governments, cities, um, universities, colleges, etc. Large organizations, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the National Weather um, Association, or what, it, I'm, I'm, it's drawing a blank, I'm terrible at remember name, remembering names when I need to, but there was a, a set of tornadoes going through um, Central America last year, and the oh, the National Weather I think it's association association, yeah. association I think so. Um, they sent they targeted you know geo targeted the region that that tornado was about one of the tornadoes was about to strike, and they sent they mo- they used um, the cell towers around that region to send push notifications to every single cell phone that was in that region and they gave people a 15 minute heads up wow and saved amazing amounts of lives like un un, unseen or untold amounts of lives number of lives so the power so i love that you just brought up geotargeting and push notifications for me those are just those two of 
the most important features to save lives, to get out messaging. I mean, if we scale it down to an organizational crisis. So I ask, I have, uh, we have, Agnes Day has a lot of, um, of clients in, in energy. So I'll talk to, you know, some of the executives and I'll say, okay, so you have, you've got, you guys got men, people out on the field, you've got people out on, you know, on the roads. If a crisis were to strike wherever and say, it, and, you know, reporters were to find themselves at one of your facilities and they were to swarm some of, you know, from your miners to whoever's there, do you feel confident that those people, members of your team, whose job is not a spokesperson and whose job is not to manage a crisis or to communicate in a crisis, do you feel confident that they would know what to say or what not to say in that moment? And the answer is always the blood rushes out of their face and they go, no, you know, like, there, but there's no way because they have 600 to, you know, 6,000 to 30,000 employees all over the world, all over the country. You can't, nobody, you know, and it's not their role. However, today, and the same goes for Twitter. What if they're on Twitter? And, you know, and I use this example all the time that we're so used to on Twitter just talking with everybody. Somebody at mentions us, asks us, a, asks us a question. It's second nature now to just shoot back an answer and have a nice little conversation on Twitter. What if it's a reporter? What if it's a reporter and they ask a question that's, you know, with, um, with a, an ulterior motive behind it that the person just isn't aware of to even recognize? And they send an answer back. And that answer, you know, basically puts the organization in more trouble and it goes viral. You know, you see this all the time. And uh, within our app, we, we have a communication message based on crisis that tells everybody who has the app what their scripted answer should be. So if you don't speak for the organization, that scripted uh, text is going to tell you, yeah, that's going to say, you know, in order to avoid confusion, misinformation, I'm going to direct you to so and so. And it's as simple. And the power of mobile technology, you know. <laughs> so, and that's that's exactly where I was getting at. Where you can send. Here's the key message that you need to communicate. If anybody from anywhere gets in touch with you, whether it be your mother on Facebook, a reporter on Twitter, or a reporter who's coming to location. Absolutely, and you know, when you, if you watch that Washington D.C a mall situation where the guy killed uh, people inside the mall. Mm -hmm. uh, they were talking to people on CNN that were representing companies and having interviews from with them inside the facility. And these people were just talking. They were talking about anything and everything. And it just made me very concerned for those organizations that they didn't have a communication plan in place that informed the managers of that store that if you were contacted during a crisis, that you are not the spokesperson for our organization. Yep. And that what you say has an impact. And even with the best intentions, it just, it can have a negative impact, unfortunately. Right. Uh, understood. And, and I know the people there were trying to be helpful and, and, uh, provide insight, but really, um, uh, I just didn't know what the next word out of the mouth of that person was going to be. Oh. It made me very nervous for that company. Absolutely. So imagine being able to directly get in touch because, I mean, the reality is that whoever is watching, say the, the spokesperson or the senior member of the crisis team is looking at that, it's very possible that they don't have that person's text, you know, phone number to send them a text or to give them a call and say, ah, please zip it, <laughs> you know, but exactly. if they had access to, if everybody within the organization had that app that connects everybody and you could send a push notification, it just makes your life so much easier and the risks become small, um, not smaller, but less. More manageable. Sure. Yes, more manageable. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that probably is worth spending a little time on is security. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Because, because people are always worried about having their crisis plan on a device. You know, it always amazed me uh, when they worry about it being on a device, while it, when it was on paper, it was readily accessible for to everybody, the whole plan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but when we put it on a mobile device, they say, well, you know, they're going to have that with them. What if somebody got it? Well, if your plan's built correctly, you know, the security is they're only going to see one role within the organization, not all the roles. So instead of getting the entire plan like it is on paper, you only get the steps or the checklist for the, that specific role, whether it's a minor role or whether that's the role of a, uh, a manager or a superintendent of a school district or a communications director, which would limit anybody from having complete access. But, but even so, um, making sure that you're, if you are going to use mobile technology, that the information on the device is secure, password protected, and that your plan doesn't freely float um, in the hands of people that might use it uh, to the detriment of your organization. Absolutely. Security. And you know, it's funny that it, or it's not funny that you bring it up, but it's funny when I think deeper into this because. Uh, there's an attorney who's, you know, part of our crisis intelligence team at Agnes Day. Her name is Judith Delaney, and she is really, really big and very knowledgeable. Actually, she's an expert on the subject of sec in online security, online privacy issues, security. And there's this big, especially in California, it's really starting. Um, there's a big issue around app security. Apps are created so quickly today whether it's an organizational app, whether it's a, an app that, you know, wants to be the next new thing and get sold to Facebook for billions of dollars. They're created right. so quickly and the demand is so high that to actually security on apps is puts everybody who downloads the majority of apps at very high risk for invasion of privacy, for, um, you know, breach of, you know, going in a breach of, of the device, um, mm -hmm. Being hacked within the device, which in in if you go up the ladder there, it puts organizations at risk because for sure every employee has a mobile device. Every employee on that mobile device today, if it's a smartphone, they have an app. If that app is insecure, unsecure, then they you know potentially could have access to emails, to confidential data, to um, trade secrets to whatever's on that mobile device and whatever that mobile device is connected, whatever system it's connected to. So it's very interesting that when I see, you know, the pushback of, well, may it's, it's too easily accessible, or maybe it, it puts us at more risk because it's not secure, the app, when everybody is at risk right now. <laughs> and it's an issue that's very big. I mean, um, the attorney general of California is really pushing to get the word out and to fight for um, adequate privacy policies and safety features to be built into every app, no matter what the app, right? So if we're doing it correctly on our end when it comes to developing apps or uh, for crisis communications for organizations, that is very important and it's even less at risk than every other app that's on their phone. Right. Am I making sense? <laughs> And it's, yes. it's just funny for me to, because it's, a, it's an issue, it's a, but it's also an issue that most people aren't aware of. They only think of it when they go, okay, well, if it's crisis communications app, well, how does that put us at risk? But right. when, we have to do our when, due diligence. Yeah, so when they downloaded the game app and they don't think about that one, um, but that game app might have a, a, a bug or a window into it that allows people to access other data on their phone. So absolutely, I think... Security is important, and we need to make sure that um, the apps are developed and secure and safe and encrypted so that the organization can feel comfortable that their data is, is, is more protected than what they were experiencing in a paper or a SharePoint type of uh, environment. Absolutely. And it's... It's it's our responsibility as I mean we're 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 risk managers. <laughs> we identify <laughs> risk. This is a risk, and it's a it's a it's a legitimate concern. But we have to take that role very very seriously. Right. I, I do think that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I do I do think that organizations also have to look at how do you want to manage your crisis plans um, throughout your entire organization. You know, is this a distributed model? Is this a, um, a, a corporate model that gets distributed out? Um, because 
it's very difficult to have a one specific crisis tool at one location and a different one at a different location because these this has to be seamless in a time of an emergency Absolutely. so you should ad adopt a platform a platform should allow you to accomplish the goals of uh, messaging even between groups so maybe you need to not only message your group in uh, California but also your group in Ontario but maybe you have to have the ability for the Ontario group to message and communicate with uh, um, New Mexico, et cetera, directly. Um, so you have to have that flexibility. You have to have that platform. And it's our opinion that if you manage that effectively, you get the greatest ability to share communications across the entire organization in a very, very short period of time. It's, it's so important and it's such... Oh, there's so many benefits and there's, it's all available to us. You know, all the answers to these issues and these, these issues that can, in a crisis, mean the difference between life and death or mean the difference between whatever it is that's severe, you know, long-term reputational damage on the organization or, you know, or not. <laughs> right. And the answers are available to they're so easily available to us today it's just about asking the right questions and and putting the right minds to it which i think that hopefully we've done a great job today at, at kind of opening up people's minds to the importance and the benefits of leveraging mobile technology for crisis communications and um on that note jim it's always such a pleasure to talk to you thanks for taking the time to have this interesting fascinating discussion with me one that i'm very passionate about oh thank you melissa i am too and it's um it's one of our daily thoughts you know how can we do this better how can we make uh companies organizations more secure and safe and uh we spend every minute of our day doing the same thing you do uh, hopefully helping people to achieve their goals there. Absolutely. So tell us where people can follow and find you. Well, Crisis Go is crisisgo.com. Um, so from the web, you can reach us there. Um, you can find us in the Google uh, iTunes store or on Android Play. But uh, to be able to um, really get the taste of it, you have to have a login and password. Uh, so if you come to our website, we can set you up a trial account uh, really actually experience the the tool set that we have. Um, whether you're a hospital, uh, corporation, uh, school district, or, or government, uh, we'll be uh, anxious to help you to solve these problems that we talked about today. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jim. Oh, thank you, Melissa. You have a nice day. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Stay tuned next Sunday when I speak with Rob Burton, Managing Director of PreparedX, about testing your crisis plan and crisis team with interactive crisis simulations. We appreciate all of your support, and if you could share this podcast and even go on iTunes and Stitcher and write us a review, give us your thoughts, your feedback, and any questions and suggestions that you may have, for topics on crisis communications that you would like to hear about, we definitely want to hear from you. Also, if you have any questions for Jim from Crisis Go that I either didn't have the opportunity to ask or that you think of later, send me your questions via email and I'll make sure to get them to Jim and I'll get you an answer probably in the form of a blog post on the Crisis Intelligence blog over at agnesday.com. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, and I look forward to talking more crisis intelligence with you next Sunday. Mm -hmm.